Dr. Michael. I'm really glad to see you today. We will be speak on the front on the frameworks of our project, City as a Classroom. Okay. And I really thank you that you will find the time. So, Mike, I have come across some of your books, like the science, the new science of cities, building a science of cities, and cities and complexity. Could you please share with us about this science of cities? What is it, and what are the most important aspects of this science? Okay. Well, um, I think you could probably we could probably all agree that the isn't a single science of cities. It's not just one science of cities, but there are, there are many sciences of the city. Um, well, there are almost as many scientists, uh, sciences of the city are, are, as there are people thinking about cities, really, in that sense. But the kind of science that I'm talking about in the book um, is a more abstract science. It's an, a science of how things relate to one another in cities. It's a science, if you like, of why people move and why they interact and why they locate and how cities change with respect to these things. So it relates very much to the way we've looked at cities probably for the last two or three hundred years, even longer, uh, with respect to the physical arrangement of things in cities, the location of things. So problems about congestion, problems about density, problems about urban sprawl, problems about uh, uh, movement, etc. All of these are really part of this uh, science of cities. Now, the reason why I called the book uh, The New Science of Cities is because these ideas that I'm talking about have been around for a long time. If you go back to the 19th century, then there were people thinking about the shape of cities uh, and thinking about how we could build economic models of the shape of cities and so on. Um, back till then. There were the, the, the school of German location theorists, for example, from uh, the late 19th century into the uh, middle 20th century, and then um, uh, there were sort of quantitative uh, geographers and economists working on cities about 100 years or so ago in the United States. Anyway, uh, a lot of that kind of science, basically, um, has now been uh, is now being underpinned by uh, new approaches which are coming out of physics. Actually, some of the approaches coming out of physics are not that new, but they're really related to thinking about uh, uh, measuring, as it were, many of these properties of location. So, for example, using statistical ideas, statistical physics, for example, to actually express things. So, um, this is the search for uh, new kinds of uh, new kinds of generalization, new kinds of laws, if you like. They're not, they're not laws in the strong scientific sense, but the regularities that relate to uh, city sizes uh, and the distribution of uh, different uh, elements of the city, different activities of the city, uh, looking at uh, uh, different densities and so on in different places. So, so that's really the nature of what I'm talking about. Now, as part of that, um, the idea of complexity theory has become very significant. And over the time when these ideas have been developed, uh, people have begun to think of cities as being complex systems. It, mm -hmm. Cities were all, were all, are always, they've always been complex systems in the past. But the complexity point of view uh, tends to um, emphasize the notion that cities um, uh, that cities are really highly unpredictable in many ways uh, in terms of their shape and form and their dynamics. And that basically to understand cities, we need to look at cities really from the bottom up rather than the top down. A hundred years ago, people thought of society, economies, cities and so on, really in top down terms. They used the idea of the city as a machine. Now, the, the notion of complexity theory is to turn this on its head and to think of the city as being something that evolves, mm -hmm. more like an organism, more like a biological system. So evolution, rather than you know, the manufacture or systematic structure of cities, evolution is really the watchword of complexity theory. So a lot of this new science really relates to that. Thank you so much. So that, in a nutshell, is basically 
what I mean by the design. Yeah. And if you will see about city as a biological organism, how do you think, how do you think, what is consist of this organism? From which levels or how it looks like? Okay, well, one of the, one of the things that uh, is very central to this idea um, is that we as individuals uh, are, are continually making decisions about what goes on in cities. Um, and if you think of trying to organize the city and model the city as the product of all our individual decisions from the bottom up, we would say, uh, then one needs some kind of organizing structure to do that. And of course, it's extremely difficult to find out what those structures are. That when we act, we may all act rationally within our own parameters, but it might look as though we're acting randomly. Uh, we may be rational, but we may appear to be, be acting uh, randomly. So it's very difficult to um, build uh, models that uh, take account of very large numbers of decisions. Of course, um, uh, the city doesn't develop purely as a function of very large number of individual decisions. There are also group decisions, although most people acting as groups act as individuals within groups. So there is a hierarchy of decision making in cities. Generally speaking, um, some of the things we see in cities are very difficult to explain the organization of cities uh, from thinking of cities as the bottom up. So the great challenge is to think about how different patterns, uh, and uh, patterns in cities begin to emerge, as it were, by the product of very large numbers of um, individuals acting in this sense. Um, and there are some very simple models that illustrate what this is. There's a model called Schelling's model after mm -hmm. Thomas Schelling, who was a Nobel Prize winner in economics. He basically produced a model that said that um, if you located a series of individuals like ourselves uh, and randomly scattered them around a city, and half the individuals, uh, the individuals preferred to live with, um, there were two types of individuals. Um, if the one type of individual preferred to live with the same number of their own kind around them uh, and the same number of, of somebody else. So if you're a white, for example, um, uh, you're quite prepared to have 50, the, the, the people around you to be equally distributed between what, uh, black and white. But if, for example, the balance begins to change and you get more blacks than white, then the whites may actually shift their location. They may prefer to, to be with an equal number of people around them. Now, that sort of model, I can't go into uh, detail of how it works, but that sort of model uh, has to live 50-50 with mm -hmm. different people around them, and 50% the same as them. Uh, but if the balance begins to shift, then they will begin to shift. And you can very easily demonstrate that what actually happens is because cities become completely segregated into black and white in that sense. Although intrinsic to the mechanism that does that, which is bottom up and from the individual, um, the mechanisms mean that, um, uh, that basically people shift individually with respect to their own preferences. And this whole process of non-coordination leads to an extreme segregation. So if you look at the city and you see extremely segregated division between rich and poor, black and white, red and green, whatever, um, that doesn't mean to say that there is strong segregation in the minds of the individuals. They can actually take place incrementally from the bottom up. So that's an example of emergence, if you like, that we can't guess what the pattern would be by just looking what individuals do. We, we observe it, that there is some sort of emergent phenomenon, and that's the complexity, if you like, of cities, that very often we can't actually figure out uh, what might happen. And that's the reason why lots of unanticipated things happen in cities, because we can't really figure them out, really. They're happening from the bottom up. We don't know what happens until these things have played them. So, what the ultimate uh, picture would be. Thank you so much for this example and this model. Okay. And we can continue for the next question. Mike. Uh, 
In the book, The New Science of Cities, you suggested that to understand the cities, we must view them not simply as places in space, but as systems of networks and flows as a foundation of new science of cities. Could you please explain how to identify these flows and networks and relations between objects? Okay, well, if you look, the way we've looked at cities uh, for the last um, hundred or more years tends to be, the way we start to look at cities, we look at where people locate, where they live, where they work, where they shop, where they do any of these things. So we look at locations, right? So in other words, um, we look at where the parents are, we look at where the most schools are, and so on. We look at, in other words, different locational patterns. And when we map these things, we see um, we see some of the segregation, the polarization, and the patterning, basically, in cities that I was just referring to a moment ago. Um, strictly speaking, to explain those patterns, in the past we've tried to explain the patterns um, purely in terms of location, what is near what. But well, but we find that it's not really possible to explain those patterns without unpacking them, because any particular set of locations um, relates to where people are coming from and where they're going to in this sense. So in other words, to explain how many people are located mm -hmm. in the centre of town, um, for work purposes, say, then we need to figure out where they come from. And it's not immediately obvious that they all come uh, from the same place or the same places. They may, may come from all over the place. So, for example, in a world city like London or Moscow or something mm -hmm. like this, you've got lots of people who come from all over the place, basically. Um, Globalisation mm -hmm. means that you have people from all around the world who are living and working and doing things in cities. Uh, and so, in some sense, to explain what happens in a city, you really need to know where people are coming from, in that sense. And that implies some kind of transportation network. Um, so the argument in the book is that we need these networks to be able to explain locations. Locations is simply one aspect of the network. It's when we take a network and we look at all the different uh, flows and interactions which come into a particular point or node in the network. Um, and so to explain the node, we need to know the network in this sense. Having said that, um, cities are highly complicated systems, and they have many networks. So, for example, if we're looking at, say, financial services in a city, uh, the financial quarter in, uh, for example, here in London, in the city of London, or in New York, in Manhattan, etc., Frankfurt, any of these places, Tokyo, Moscow, Paris, and so on, if you look at those locations, uh, then it's not just movement networks that are important, it's information networks. So c c critically, um, in terms of financial transactions, a vast array of activity is conducted across email and um, uh, telephone lines and the whole range of different networks, some of which are physical, others of which to all intents and purposes may be non-physical. So for example, I mean, the internet, is this, although there is a physical presence to the internet, um, the internet is really everywhere in some sense because when you send an email, I don't know this conversation we're having now, for example, um, you know, we've both got the pictures of ourselves in front of us, um, it's been done over Zoom, but were those packets of information that create these pictures and the sound and so on, and so on how they actually um, are related between where you are and where I am? We don't know. It could be that they're being sent to the other side of the moon, for all. They won't be the moon, but the other side of the Earth, in a sense. So packets of information are broken up and then reassembled. And it happens instantly, from our point of view, in that sense, so we get a kind of coherent uh, conversation. Um, uh, so in that sense, we've got literally hundreds of networks uh, in cities, thousands of networks, which all in interlock with each other and enable us to do things, and really to get a good sense of why things happen in, in, in a particular place, we need to know what these networks are. So that really is the essence of one of the themes in the book, that we need to look at networks in that sense. So everywhere we look, in terms of everything we do in cities, 
uh, and even how we think about cities, we need to look at networks in that sense. You said that it's uh, really important to know from which countries people, or which cities people came to the city. Yeah. If we can see from this uh, viewpoint, I know that your research involves the development of computer models of cities and regions, geographical information science and urban and regional modeling. How do you think the cities are influenced by their geographical position and exactly how this position makes the difference between the cities? Yeah, well, um, in some senses, if we look at the distribution of different city sizes, then it, there's a very obvious, um, a very obvious point that we only have a small number of very big cities and we have a large number of very small cities. So we have a law, if you like, about, uh, we sometimes read these things as scaling laws, but the, the law basically, or the rule basically says that in any economy or society, um, resources are scarce and therefore um, if we want to uh, uh, pool resources for everybody in that sense, then one way of doing that is to locate these resources in a very central place somewhere, uh, a big city, and then those resources are organized in such a way that they're then distributed to the rest of the population, who would not be in the big city particularly, but be in lots of cities in that particular context. So, for example, national government is an, an example of a resource that is focused in um, a capital city normally, um, and it has a lot of functions which spread out to all the other cities. Um, it's unlikely that you would have more than one capital. Occasionally you might have financial capital and you might have political capital uh, in different places, etc. Even that's comparatively rare um, in some senses. So uh, there are many functions in big cities that really pertain to all the cities in the system. And therefore one has a hierarchy of cities with uh, a small number of very big ones and a, uh, a large number of very small ones. Now that hierarchy of city sizes is changing continually in the sense that um, uh, some of the little cities are getting bigger, uh, some of the little cities are getting smaller and disappear in that sense. So you have a kind of bubbling kind of economic cauldron really of, uh, of, of, of cities that are competing with each other to some extent. You can think of it in terms of competition um, and eventually, some of those cities become bigger, um, and, 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 but most remain small in this context. So what we're seeing in the world at the moment is because more and more people are living in cities and moving to cities, basically, then more big cities are being created, uh, but medium-sized cities that are more medium-sized, many more medium-sized cities being created than big cities. Of course, to be a big city, you've got to be a medium-sized city first, really, in some sense, or a small city in that context. So, in other words, um, the idea of, uh, uh, of resources being shared, basically, relates to this hierarchy of cities, in that sense, um, with a few big cities and a large number uh, of small cities. And that really is a, a model that um, is, is an economic model about what we could actually afford. If we all got much richer... Uh, then we'd probably be able to have more big cities, basically, or more specialized cities. That's probably what we've got. As cities get bigger, they get a bit more specialized. As our resources increase, they get more specialized. But there are limits to this. There are limits to this in terms of distance um, and space in this particular context. So uh, to if you're talking about physical distance and moving to cities, then there's a limited... Um, uh, there's a limited amount of time and distance that you have to cross uh, in terms of living in a city. So uh, that puts a, a break, if you like. That puts a, a limit on the size of cities that we can actually build in some senses. Um, a good example of this is that until about um, 250, 300 years ago, uh, there are really no cities that got bigger than a million people, basically. Um, Rome got to about a million. London mm -hmm. got to a million at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, 
you know, Nanjing, uh, Nanking, uh, and Beijing have got to a million in, you know, five, six hundred years ago, that kind of thing. But nothing got more than a million. In other words, the technology to organize things in cities couldn't get, it, it, it couldn't actually produce cities which were any bigger than a million, basically. But once the Industrial Revolution began, we got railways to begin with, and then a hundred or more years later, we got motor cars and so on, electricity. Um, and that enabled us to break out of this threshold, this constraint of a million, basically, in that mm -hmm. sense. And cities get, have got now to, well, the biggest cities tend to be in the order of about 30 million, 35 million, something like that. Um, Tokyo and Mexico City are often talked about, but there, there are much bigger cities. There are bigger cities out there, like, uh, like the Hong Kong Guangzhou, um, uh, Macau region, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Shanghai, Nanjing region, and so on. These are very big complexes of about 50 million. They're really big cities that have come together, grown together. So in other words, uh, you have a limit on the size of the city compared to the technology. Uh, and that probably is not going to change very dramatically unless we get extremely different types of technology. If we were to get uh, very high-speed trains, for example, uh, which were uh, which which enabled us to move between uh, big cities in, on very short uh, distances, short time periods, uh, then we might get some change in city structures at that level. But it's unlikely, from what we know, that we would get those transport technologies which would be available to a very large number of the population. They'd still be very specialist in this particular context. Um, uh, only the motor car has actually led to our universal uh, uh, universe, our, our ability to have a very large number of the population to actually travel under their own steam in that sense. Um, uh, and that's why we get cities like Los Angeles and Phoenix and places like that, which are very spread out, because everybody has cars, and wherever you go, you actually drive a car, basically. In older cities, like Moscow and to some extent, certainly in, in London and so on, then I think you get, um, uh, you, you, you have limits on, the, on the, the size they can get to, because there's so much fixed capital um, investment already, historically, in those cities, that you can't really turn them upside down and turn them into a kind of automobile orientated city really. So there are these sort of basic mm -hmm. limits, if you like, on city size. Now part of the science of cities is a little bit, I don't talk about that much in the book, that, that's, that, that sort of stuff very much in the book, but a little bit of it is there, I think, yeah. Thank you so much. Also I know that one of your key research about cities is urban systems and methods and fractal cities. Mike, yeah. could you please to clarify what is exactly fractal cities? Fractal, okay, well, um, now, if we go back to complexity theory, one of the things I actually said was that um, uh, the complexity theory point of view suggests that we have systems which are composed of many individual parts. They may be individuals, in a city of a million people we have, well, the city of a million people, let's say we have like uh, 300,000 households, basically, that act as a unit. We've got 300,000 decision-making units who are making decisions all the time about uh, where they're going to go to work, you know, what they're going to eat and they, during the day. A million things they're making decisions about. Um, uh, some of these systems where decisions are made at the bottom up um, lead to systems which repeat themselves across different spatial scales. So if we have a, um, a simple um, relationship that we need to develop uh, a population, a housing estate of a certain density, and we, we need to service that housing estate with a transportation path in a certain way, uh, then often, that, if that principle is efficient, we might apply the principle mm -hmm. at different scales, basically. So a fractal is an object where you have a, a, a rule or a pattern that is repeated across different scales. Now, the very best example of this is the tree. You look at a tree, um, and you look at the shape of a tree, 
if you actually go to the smallest element of the tree, which is a branch mm -hmm. with twigs on, basically, and you break the branch off the tree, and it's got twigs on it, mm -hmm. and if you then rescale that branch, basically, up to the size of the whole tree, think about magnifying it, you see the same structure in the twig and the leaves as you do in the tree itself. So, in other words, when you look at a tree, it's composed of little trees, right? Um, and then the little trees are composed of even smaller trees. Mm -hmm. And the way the thing grows, basically, is to grow according to this template, this path, in a sense. Now, in terms of cities, we see those sorts of patterns recurring. We see that in transportation networks, basically. Um, that we see uh, there is a motorway network or a freeway network, which is uh, for high-speed cars and so on, uh, which is built at a certain top level down. And below that, we have other networks that are taking more local traffic and all the way down to sort of street networks. And we can see a degree of fractality. Fractal means, fractal actually means fractional dimension, but the key uh, principle here is what we call self-similarity, meaning that things are similar, they're self-similar over different scales, over different spatial scales. So when we look at a city, we mm -hmm. see a big central business district, a big town centre. Uh, we often see several smaller town centres within the city. And then within these, the hinterlands or areas of these smaller town centres, we see neighbourhood centres, district centres, and then neighbourhood centres, and so on. So we see a kind of a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, the same principle being exercised both in terms of networks and in terms of locations at different levels of space. And that's what we refer to as a fractal. Um, uh, now, to some extent, there is no such thing as a pure fractal apart from in mathematics, where we can actually, you know, produce pure fractals in some sense. But there's always a bit of distortion in the real world. So um, although the tree is an excellent example of a fractal growing structure, which has self-similar clarity, um, the particular shape of the tree will be dictated by a lot of random factors like the wind and the orientation, the elevation, all of these sorts of things will change uh, will change the particular realization or, 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 or growth of that tree. It won't change the basic structure because that's the kind of practical rule about self-similarity, the efficiency rule that really relates to the growth of the fractal. Um, but it will change the particular position of the tree mm -hmm. in this context. It changed the, the reason why all the leaves aren't the same on a tree is exactly because of this, you've got these random occurrences taking place, in a sense, in, the, in that particular way. So, so that's the nature of the idea of the fractal city. The fractal city can be seen as patterns of things, of locations and networks, which exist from the top down or the bottom up. In other words, we can identify different levels of network and different patterns of location at these different levels from the top down uh, or, or from the bottom up. Thank you. Can we speak a little bit more about fractal cities? You said that they have different yeah. levels. Maybe you can explain about different forms, if there are different forms yeah. of fractal cities or geometry, yeah. how it, and maybe some examples of this, like what yeah, you yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, uh, a good example of a very regular fractal is um, uh, a city that is planned almost religiously in a very well-structured way. So, for example, um, cities that are developed according to some standard template and are often developed quickly are examples almost of pure fractals. A good example is the Roman cap, basically. In other words, when the Roman legions basically decided to pitch a cap, they had a whole set, they had a template of things that they did. They, they laid out the location of the forum, um, they laid out the location uh, of the barracks, basically. Uh, they laid out the sort of uh, center of the camp, 
etc. And in other words, they could do this within a matter of a few days, basically, lay out a camp in this particular way. So, and when you look at those pictures of these Roman camps, basically, often um, the camp or the force became the town itself, then you can actually see a very rigid pattern in that sense. Um, and most towns which are planned very quickly, um, uh, often due to colonization, uh, are towns that, um, most towns that, 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 that are planned quickly uh, use these templates, these very standard templates to actually establish uh, the location of activities. Um, if you look at uh, cities in the United States, then because the United States began to grow very rapidly uh, from really the beginning of the 19th century onwards through immigration, then the various commissioners and governors basically in the United States planned, um, they planned their cities in a very regular way. So if you look at the grid pattern in Manhattan, in 1813 they laid out this grid pattern, sort of like a fractal pattern basically, with neighborhoods of different sizes on a grid. And that model came to resemble many cities in the United States, even the states themselves are laid out to some extent on an arbitrary lap long grid. Now, if you looked at Manhattan back in 1813, in downtown Manhattan, Wall Street, you can even see today, Wall Street looks much more like a European settlement. The, 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 the lanes, basically, it's like a slowly growing organic town. We often say that um, those towns grow more organically, more incrementally. They have they don't have a they don't have a top-down pattern basically or template in quite the same way uh, as rapidly growing towns do in that sense. So that's an extreme example of a fractal where you you can you can you can you can organise this from from the top down and you can sort of state how the different regular geometric principles are actually applied. Uh, there's another good example in the United States, which is the town of Savannah. Uh, in Georgia, which is laid out in a grid. There are lots of examples of this uh, rapidly growing new town tree laid out in this particular fashion. Now, a town that grows in the opposite way, a town which grows much more incrementally without a plan, we refer to this often as an organically growing town. Um, a town that grows in that particular way um, uh, is much more like one of these uh, natural or biological fractals, like a tree, basically. So, for example, what begins to happen is the town is laid out, and um, you have a central point, often where the original settlement of the town is. It might be, you know, a bridge across a river, something like that. Uh, and then people begin to cluster around that particular point. Um, and as they uh, gradually cluster, they begin to uh, use principles for uh, how closely they relate to each other in terms of density, and they often have principles about how they locate in that particular way. As, for example, the town grows, people are to always trying to maximize the nearness to the center of town, but also trying to get as much space as possible. So the town grows out, really, in this particular context. And very often you can see um, a naturally growing town as having higher densities of population because the people who came first were able to get the best locations and so on. As the town grows, people want more space and you can only really get that space on the edge, basically. And so the town grows in this particular way. So you get, you can build a model of this showing you how a, a, a town might be quite compact in its center, but quite sprawling at the edge. And of course, um, depending on what template you have for um, the location of things, mm -hmm. uh, the, the template um, will determine the geometry, the detailed geometry of the town, etc. Um, but to some extent, the, the geometry is at different levels, really, in a sense. A pure fractal is such where you would get um, the geometry like in a tree. The geometry would be similar at different spatial scales, in a sense. But in real towns, you have so many, as well as these principles, you have so many random factors which are based on local idiosyncrasies such as the underlying 
you know, physical geology of the town, um, water resources, um, climate, a whole range of things that often these principles have to be adapted, basically, to the local conditions in that sense. And then you even get situations where the government the governance of the town, uh, the wealth of the society, all of these things begin to make a difference to precisely what you actually see on the ground. So to explain really uh, the evolution of any town, you would have to uh, explain things, you know, in terms of as, as much of this kind of history and context as possible really in that sense. Thank you so much. And may I ask last question, please? Yeah. So because frame of our work project is a city as a classroom. So the question is, on your opinion, what are the function of cities? What if different cities influence us in different ways and teach us as a people on different levels? How do you think about it? Well, I think we need to learn from as many examples as possible, right? I think that, um, I, I think we need to learn about um, how these principles that I've been alluding to, the, the principles that I've been sort of referring to, how these are adapted under different conditions, different situations. It's a bit like saying that the historical context of how a town evolves, how a town develops, is all important in learning, you know, what the possibilities are. And we've not really talked about, you know, good towns and bad towns very much in this conversation, but um, quite clearly there are examples uh, which would not, uh, you would not want to emulate uh, where, for example, the transportation congestion was uh, incredibly bad, um, uh, 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 where things had not been planned in an appropriate way or developed in an appropriate way in that context. So uh, in many senses, uh, the whole uh, 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 Excuse me. A whole range of plans uh, need to be looked at in terms of drawing examples in that particular context, and it's very difficult to um, <coughs> it's very difficult in advance to actually specify what the most appropriate elements of any city plan or any ideal city or sustainable city might actually be. It would very much depend on the times in which we live. Uh, the historical context, the political context, and the economic context, really, in this particular context. So my view would be, quite, I have quite a general view about this, that, in other words, one needs to look at individual examples of towns, and a starting point might be to look at ideal towns, or optimum towns, in a sense. <clears throat> so there's a whole range of different idealizations, ideal towns, um, in different cultures, different societies around the world. Um, and in some sense, a good starting point to think about the future of cities is to think about what these ideal towns are. They tend to be ideal types. In other words, you don't find that they are implemented um, religiously in every particular place. They tend to be um, uh, idealizations, really, in that sense. So Corbusier's City of Tomorrow, um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Broider Broadacre City, you know, uh, Ebenezer Hatton's Garden City of Tomorrow. Um, these were kind of ideal town forms. And there are still plenty of those around in Britain at the moment. Uh, there are a number of suggestions for new types of garden city, which are not like the garden cities of 120 years ago, but these would be much more up to date and modern technologies and so on. But nevertheless, similar principles about densities and accessibility and so on. Um, uh, and in other parts of the world, you see that um, uh, in terms of smart cities, for example, there's a number of uh, examples of smart cities which are like smart new towns. So, for example, Mazda in the United Arab Republic, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, I should say, at um, Abu Dhabi, I think, outside of Abu Dhabi. Um, that's an example of one of these high-tech towns where you know, all of the communications are done through uh, intelligent transportation and things of that sort. Um, the buildings are controlled in a sense. So, again, these are idealizations, um, and to some extent, they, that's a good starting point.
<coughs> a good starting point for this. But um, having said that, one also needs to look at existing towns, really. You have to look at the whole range of towns, I think, in that sense, to get to, to, to be able to establish some contact. So you have this great um, array of towns around the world, really, um, and to some extent it's getting an appreciation of what the dominant forces are uh, which lead to the good and the bad in, in any of these towns, really, to be able to make these sort of comparisons. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention and for your time. And I really appreciate that you today find time with us.